Sorry. Okay, transaction analysis. Um, so transaction analysis was created by a psychiatrist by the name of Eric Byrne. Um, and he used to run social psychiatry seminars in Mount Zion Hospital in the 50s. And he published his first book on the subject, which is this one, Transaction Analysis in Psychotherapy in 1961. And it's a pretty good book. The only problem with his book is the writing's really small, so although it's uh, 260 odd pages, it's a lot more than that really, if it was in a bigger print book. Um, he also published another book called Games People Play, which is a lot easier to read and goes into basically games that we play as human beings when we interact with other people that we're going to come on to, but that's a nice, easy, easier book to read. Um, and also one of his students, who was a re research director, a guy called Claude Steiner, um, published a book called Scripts People Live, and this, Claude Steiner kind of um, carried the baton on. Uh, and developed it a little bit further. These are a little bit uh, more up to date and easier to read, but um, I'm going to recommend some books if you want to read them all. I've read them all by this one and I'm three quarters of the way through, um, but they're really, really interesting. It's, and I find it's a real great dynamic on how the personality um, is subdivided, if that makes sense. Um, so one day he was working with a client and he thought that he, he, he noticed two separate ego states in the client. Um, one was a very astute, mature, reasonable state, and the other a very immature, childlike state. So he basically started to discover the different ego states in, in characters that we all have. And he basically said that we've got ego states that resemble parental figures, so what we call the parent ego states, which he called it exteropsychic. Ego states that objectively appraise reality, like adult um, or rational um, ego states, neopsychic. An ego states that fixated early in childhood, archaeopsychic, and he named them parent, adult and child. And he felt that in any social interaction, um, people would exhibit one of these ego states, which we're going to break down. So we've got the parent ego state. So this is the ego state of life as it's been taught, uh, mimics the gestures. And sometimes you see this for those who've got kids or got nephews and nieces. If you've ever seen somebody's child who's been maybe told off by a parent, they'll do exactly the same thing to maybe a toy or one of the friends. I told you not to do that. Exactly the same tonality and, and, and gestures. Uh, and children, up until the age of, of six, some psychological schools of psychology say, particularly this one or seven, become very, uh, the brains become very plastic and they say they walk around in a state of hypnosis. So they're picking up things all the time from their surroundings, particularly parents and um, authority figures. This ego state is also responsible for, set, set, uh, responsible, rather, for setting boundaries, limits, traditions. Also gives us advice, guidance, criticisms, and protects or nurtures the self. So it's split into two subcategories. So I'm going to use this, Dorman, as the first one, uh, which is called the critical parent. Now, when I'm working with children, because they won't have seen a Dorman, I use the boxer dog um, for working with kids. Um, Elaine's got five of these nicely set up, um, so I recommend if you're doing this. So I, I initially got these characters to work with kids, but then I found out, because of understanding this, that we've all got a child ego state, and people understand it better like this. So this is responsible for protecting the self and others from physical or emotional harm, um, in, in terms of with advice or criticism. Um, the level of accuracy, this internal or external dialogue, will be based on the experiences of the child in childhood. So what they've learned as they were growing up. Um, so what I've learned is um, working with boxers and doing my research, it's got a hierarchy of things it wants to uh, protect us against. And what I found out is it wants to protect us from death, obviously, serious injury, obviously. And the third thing that I learned was it protects us from being embarrassed or shamed. Um, and I had a friend of mine who took his life, um, uh, rest in peace, but a, um, he did it because he was in debt and he was embarrassed about how he would be perceived in terms of that debt. So I did a lot of research on it because at the time it was a very upsetting time for me. Um, but I realised that the, the reason we do this is that we've, we've got hardwired into our psyche 
that when we used to hunt in clans, so if we were all together, hunting and um, looking after ourselves on our own was very ineffective. So if we all got together, we could have a unit where we work together, we can cook, we can hunt, and we look after ourselves, protect each other, we had a greater chance of survival. So what happened is hardwired into our brains is we fire off this embarrassment or shame experience whenever we do things that are going to get us chucked out of the clan. Because if you get chucked out of the clan, you're going to die because living on your own, hunting on your own, very slim chances. Um, and hopefully, I hope to put all this information in the book that I've been working on for a long time now called The Embarrassment Epidemic. Um, this is also an ego state that stops people from going into hypnosis, okay, so it gets in the way. Um, can also, it sort of stands on the door of the mind and will, will stop people from taking advice and things like that. Um, the nurturing parent is this character here that I'm going to use to represent, which is there to comfort and um, love ourselves and others, okay? Um, so all of you mums in, in the room and dads um, will understand this, this is how, you know, what looks after your children. Communicates verbally and physically in ways to make the individual or others feel better if they're hurt physically or, or emotionally, in the same way that the parents or guardians did. Now, the next one is the adult. Uh, unfortunately Spock's lost his leg, but for those of you old enough, um, Spock was very unemotional and was just completely logical. So this is the ego state of life as it's thought. It's essential for our survival as it's able to analyse and interpret data very, very quickly internally and externally. So any of you have been into that flow state where you're just kind of doing things without thinking, that's this state, which is also what I, I believe to be the state of hypnosis. Okay. Um, it's very rational, logical, reasonable, um, and in games people play, uh, which Eric Byrne wrote, he said the ego state would experience setbacks and gratifications, so it therefore processes all the complex data and delivers a certain set of behaviours in order to complete a task. So if you're crossing the road, it will analyse things really, really quickly to make sure you cross safely, or if you're playing a game. You know, you don't consciously, if you're playing badminton or something, you don't consciously go, oh, I'm going to do this. We naturally just go through the movements and it, it replays all of the programs we've got stored in our mind. And like I said, I believe this is responsible for the trance state, the zone state, the flow state. Those states are eyes open hypnosis. For any of those who have seen me do hypnosis, it's basically you don't need your eyes closed to be in hypnosis. Um, it's also the part that responds immediately to hypnotic suggestions. And this is the part where all the programs are held that we can update. So that's why we use hypnosis or eyes open hypnosis or NLP to reprogram the stuff in there um, so that it comes out. And this is why hypnotherapy can produce rapid changes in individuals. Now the child ego state behaves exactly as it would as if we'd been taken back to the exact age it's created. So as a table full of adults, we've all experienced that time where we've done something where we kind of regress and behave exactly like a child. It might be, uh, you know, where you're excited, somebody gives you a cake and you go, yippee! You know. So I, I didn't do that as a kid. <laughs> Just an example. Um, but you, you, you're taken back to that exact age. Um, so you use the same words, the same tonality, the same body posture, uh, the behaviour of the child. And this is life as it is felt. And like the parent, it's split into two different identities. So, firstly, Austin Powers, if you'll remember him, uh, was just into kind of self-gratification. Now, the natural child ego state it just wants to gratify itself at any time. It has no sense of how its actions will affect others or feels any guilt or remorse. So if you think about a small child, just kicks people, cries, or whatever, wants to get a cookie, or this, that, and the other, it's exactly the child state. Um, uh, that's... So, um, it only feels guilt or remorse when it clashes with the critical parent, when the critical parent says, oh, you've done this wrong, and then what we do is we see the other part of the child, which is what we call the adapted child, that will start to go, mm, right, I know I did wrong, and it starts to feel guilt, shame, or remorse. So, um, as an example of this, um, I say, uh, when people uh, get drunk, what happens is alcohol suppresses the critical parent, so we could all be walking down the street completely sober, see a line of traffic cones, and we'll all go, oh, there must be an accident or something like that. <coughs> if we've all been drinking, it suddenly becomes a, a witch's hat, a loud hailer, or things like this. Because what happens is the critical parent is suppressed, and the natural child is allowed to go out, and because it's got no sense of guilt, shame, or remorse, that's when people are drunk, they just say things and aren't bothered, say and do things that aren't bothered. What consequently happens, and this is why we get... Um, 
uh, a lot of anxiety the next day is when this comes back, it comes back with a vengeance, so it will exaggerate what we've done to say, how dare you suppress me? So it comes back in and we'll give you thoughts and feelings, you're on, we've all done it, and I'll never drink it again. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. oh yes, uh, the, the alcoholism as well, just to touch on that. So what happens sometimes, people will feel guilt, shame and remorse in the morning. Oh, I'm never going to do that again. So what some people do is we drink or drugs, they will drink again to suppress that. So they get into a cycle of alcoholism or drug addiction. When they suppress it, it wakes up, they feel that. Oh no, I'm going to get back into drugs or drink. So what's that? That's the... The adapted child, when we come into that one next. Okay. But so, feels great. Then, while well, this is suppressed, that comes back gives it a bit of a telling off, so we feel guilt, shame and remorse. Like, oh, I've got to change my behaviour. So that brings us on nicely to the adapted child ego state. This is the ego state that learns how to modify its behaviour based on interaction with significant authority figures, so that's parents, police, government, what's going on. It will do this by rebelling, withdrawing or being completely compliant following the given instructions. Now this is the um, one, one I'm using hypnosis, this is the compliant state that I need my clients to get into in order to access hypnosis here. So I need compliance from the uh, client. So we're going to touch on a, uh, a character state called the baby-faced assassin. And these are people that most of you all have mentioned this to. So these are people who appear on the outside to want your help and to want to be hypnotised or whatever else, but they don't. And these are ones to watch out for. And the ego state is like this. So it may be they'll appear to be like really compliant, but actually what's inside, we've got a mischievous little child that wants to say, basically, my life's rubbish, I want you to feel how I feel, so I'm going to do an impression. So, so what I'm feeling inside is this, my life is terrible, I'm going to get you as a therapist to feel how it feels to be in my life. But if I walk in like this, you're going to realise what I'm going to do, so I'm going to sabotage you. So what they do is they push their eyebrows up really, really high. So that's the one thing to watch out for. And because they're feeling um, anxiety, uh, anger, the muscles in the throat constrict, so the voice becomes high pitched. Oh yeah, no, I'd be a really good hypnotic subject. Want to use me? Yeah, yeah. Lots of yeses, lots of lots of ego strengthening as well. So I might go, yeah, yeah, no, you'll you'll be brilliant. Can I give you some extra money? I've heard lots of great things about you. Yeah, yeah, no, can I work with you? And they talk too quickly. It's a high pitched voice, eyebrows raised. Then what happens is you go in. They wait for your armour to go off, and you, and occasionally I've been caught out a couple of times in the past, um, a long time ago. And what you do is you go, oh yeah, no, they really do want that. So you take your arm off and they do. And then they wait for that moment where you're like this, you're at your most vulnerable, and then they go, but even you didn't help me. And you said you would, and I give you all that money, and da 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 So and then you end up feeling like them, and you end up becoming this adapted child. Um, and that can happen. So they're the people to watch out for. Now, there's another video I did where I use a sieve, and I say to people, if you imagine love and attention is salt. So imagine that's full of salt and there's a sieve here. No matter how much love and attention I give to that person, it doesn't matter, it will pour through. So what happens, that person will go, but, and this happens in relationships as well. So you get that person who goes, oh yeah, but, but if you just did this, and if you just did that for me, then it would be okay. So what happens, you pour so much salt in, you're exhausted, that it looks like the salt is layered out. But we know, because there's holes in it. It just goes through. The secret is, avoid those people at all costs. Okay, if you want to look after your mental health. But what happens is because they have a low self-esteem, it's up to them to plug the gaps in the sieve in order for them to be able to hold on to that. That's their stuff. Now, it, people will say to me, well, how do they get help? Now, what those people do is what they need to do is they need to get to this. Now, one of the things I do is when I'm working with people is if they're in um, the baby face assassin, assassin or the smiling assassin, there will be tension in the person's body language. Now, forget the face, I'm really good at spotting it, but over time you'll get better at this. The first thing you need to do is you need to get the person's hand by the wrist, and I did this the other night when I was out. The person saying, oh, nobody can help me. And I said, all right, just let go of your hand. And what I did is I grabbed the person's hand and dropped it, and this happened. There was no, I wasn't in control. The hand went like that, so I said, no. Now, if somebody's completely clock, um, Compliant, can I just borrow your hand, Cat? Yeah. Right, so resist the first time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop Cat's hand. Right, so no compliance there. Now, really let go. Really let go. There you go. That's compliance. That's the acid test that if you're working with somebody, that's what you need to find. You need that. If you haven't got that, there's stuff going on that's inhibiting the ability to get to this. When you've got that, that's the character we get into. 
which will allow us directly into the unconscious mind. And when we get into the unconscious mind, we mend all those programs like a computer really easily. And the mistake most therapists make is they don't bother to get to that. And if you don't bother, no schools teach this that I'm aware of, like, you know, we're getting kinesthetic feedback for this. No, and, and it, it's no point, because if you've got that, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, or it might be a mixture of those two. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, I want help and this and it. Doesn't matter what you throw at that, nothing will stick. Does that make sense? Yeah, because it's a barrier. Yeah.